There's no question that there are grave problems with President Trump. What state of the church is the Catholic Church in right now? I would say it's in the state of emergency. Justin Trudeau, when he says hate speech, he means speech he hates. Hello, my friends, and welcome to a new episode of Faith and Reason. This time we're discussing what went on in Texas with the San Antonio bishop canceling a Catholic family's own private ranch. Not only that, new revelations from heaven out of a religious order, also in San Antonio, Texas, very concerning. They say, indeed, that we have no shepherd in the church, but also that the reconquest over the infiltration in the church starts right now. Also, we're going to be discussing what is coming from Bishop Strickland. Bishop Strickland has been so given to the Holy Spirit that he was able to speak out on IVF same time as the Republicans just went crazy praising IVF in light of the, uh, the Alabama Supreme Court ruling. Um, and so you have this massive push pro-IVF and you have Bishop Strickland coming out right at the same time, unbeknownst to him, but he does it anyways because the Holy Spirit gives it to him and uh, is able to confront that. So we're going to take that on. But also, um, he wrote a letter, Bishop Strickland that is, wrote a letter to all the bishops, including the Pope, calling him to return to Christ. In addition, I should mention Canada, 20 years in prison for hate crime. All that and much more on this episode of Faith and Reason. Stay tuned. Father Charles Murr, Liz, you are so good to be with you. Good to be with everybody. Always a pleasure. Father, if you can start us off with the prayer, please. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Seed of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Let me just start off with uh, our trip down to Texas. We got called to go down to San Antonio, Texas, to meet with this family whose business, basically, has been totally canceled uh, by the Archbishop of San Antonio, Archbishop uh, Garcia Siller, Gustavo Garcia Siller. It's very interesting because Bishop Garcia Siller Archbishop Garcia Silla has canceled many good and holy priests. And we were able to interview some of them as well. It's a stunning story because it's a new chapter, if you will, in this cancellations of good and holy priests, in that it's the cancellation of a Catholic family business, a private business. I'd encourage you all to watch the mini documentary that our uh, videographer, John Paul Guczki, put together. It's an amazing piece. It gets to the heart of the issue. Watch just right off the bat the reaction of the mother who just, the family has sustained such hardship. They lost $425,000 in, um, in contracts just immediately. That's how brutal this is. But watch her reaction. This was a pretty direct attack from the Archbishop, from... He who is to be your spiritual leader, your spiritual father in, in the diocese. Uh, you've been in this diocese for years now. It, the church here has worked with you before. What did that feel and what's your feeling or sense towards him right now? So people think, oh, look at the 70s do this for their own, you know, to say, look at us. And that's not what it's all about. It's about bringing people to Christ. And we just feel so convicted. And if the Lord wants to, if he wants this, he will equip us to be able to fulfill this mission. And... If it's not meant to be, then, you know, it won't happen. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to follow the will of God. 
um, to know, is this his will? Is it not his will? And um, yeah, we just, we just want to be here for people. We just want to have our home opened to them. And so it's, it just, it's hard when people judge. Because people that have known us for, you know, years, right? We've been in Texas since 2012. Like, they just, they don't even feel like they can, they haven't even reached out, right? Because they're just... I don't know if they're afraid to or what, but, um, you know, sometimes you feel like you're on a little island. I mean, we have amazing friends now, new people um, supporting us, but, you know, you're constantly asking yourself, I know Dan is all the time, like, is this, you know, is this the will of God? And if it is, then we'll fight like hell to keep it. And if it's not, then God will just shut that door and we'll be okay because he's a strong man and he'll figure it out. But you've just worked so hard to build something beautiful people can experience. And for someone to just want to just take that away because they're so, I feel like he's insecure. <laughs> That's, I don't know. That's how I feel. Um, God bless you. you. We're praying for you. We will continue to. And I'm sure lots of people will be, uh, when they learn about it, part of the problem is they haven't learned yet. Yeah. Liz, why don't we go to you first? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Full disclosure, I have met um, recently Dan and Jennifer Sevigny. Um, I know many of the priests um, who work at the retreat center. Um, they, these are amazing people. And this letter, this shocking letter from um, Bishop Garcia Siller um, states, prohibits all clergy, school, retreat centers, and Catholic groups from contracting with or utilizing the Sanctus Ranch for any Catholic-sponsored retreats, meetings, activities, or spiritual endeavors. Now, as a lawyer, I'm shocked by this statement. First of all, it's a private organization. Um, he's interfering with the contracts that were already signed um, and directing anybody who has a contract to discuss those contracts with the archbishop's legal team rather than fulfilling their contract contractual obligation. This story really peeves me on so many levels because I know of uh, Dan and Jennifer's fidelity to the church. I know the good and holy priests at the ranch, and I'm well aware of the mission is for, for those who aren't paying attention, this is the prototype of the underground church, which is rapidly becoming the new church with the secularization of the Vatican, the persecution of the Vatican. And look, this is all about the traditional mass. This is wh what's going on and creating a holy center, retreat center, school, so that the faith can be passed on from generation unto generation. Um, the fact that they have lost $450,000 plus is infuriating to me. And as for those sheeple who are bowing to the knee of this bishop, don't come crying to uh, Dan and Jennifer or anybody else when your parish is closed or your Catholic schools will be closed or your towns are overrun by illegals or your churches are filled with trannies. It is time to stand up and stop this blind obedience to a hierarchy that does not have your best Catholic interest. As I said, this is about the suppression of the Latin Mass. It's about the elimination of the Latin Mass. And this is only the one but most important step towards the next one world religion. This ranch, I've not been there, but in talking to people, knowing who's behind it, it is um, this center of spirituality, of Catholic faith, of keeping the faith growing and thriving in creating a community for traditional Catholic families. And it is now 
being persecuted in under frankly under the firing squad squad and i would urge people in texas and around the country to support this family this is the model i mean jennifer and dan have given everything to ensure that this um new prototype of an underground church continues to flourish um and so you know a shout out to you john henry for bringing um this to the attention of the catholic world and i hope as a result of you know your documentary and the news surrounding this that people will really um support them and keep the, a place like this thriving because we are going to have to have these kinds of Santos ranches around the country and frankly around the world if we as catholics in our solemn duty is to pass on the faith to the next generation we must continue to do this under the severe persecution that is coming from within our church so it's a um, disturbing story but nevertheless um we've got you know wonderful people in the trenches if you want to go and support the family, you can do that at lifefunder.com slash Sanctus Ranch. You'll find that also link in the links below this story. Also, the family, of course, was in conversation with the bishop. Remember, the archbishop had been there to celebrate mass. I mean, it's so funny. He, he in his letter, of, of one of the big charges is that they're, they're using an unconsecrated altar. Except the bishop celebrated mass there as well. Are you serious? Are you serious? as did the auxiliary bishop, absolutely. They've got it on video that he did that. But guess what? Here's the other weird thing. So everybody knows Texas had freak freezing. That really never happens. So the day that Dan was supposed to go meet with the bishop, the night before his pipes froze and burst. And he had a hundred people coming in, so he had to fix them, so he has to postpone the meeting. Instead of allowing for a postponement under such severe circumstances, the archdiocese just says, no, they issued the letter. The letter which basically canceled all of their business. This is, this is so unbelievable. Father, I need to ask you though, people in the comments under the, under the, the video have been asking about obedience. Did the family not have to obey the bishop? Um, and again, they're, they built a private chapel. It's not owned by the bishop. They never said it was public mass. They're housing some canceled priests, uh, one who's living there on the property. And they're canceled anyway, and they're offering mass. And by the way, the one of them who doesn't have the faculties to hear confession uh, from the bishop won't allow for confessions. He, he won't, uh, he's not able to. And he's told people, the bishop charges that he has heard confessions. I mean, this is mind-boggling what's going on. But Father, what's what's your take and, and then your response with regard to obedience? First of all, the video, I congratulate you for the video, was, was beautiful. And it really it really uh, uh, exposed everything that's happening there. It made it very clear. And uh, it's it's really unfortunate what's happening to this family. Not just to the family. They have a, they have a much larger family, uh, which is marvelous to see. Uh, I remember other communities that began that way in the history of the of the United States, where there were monasteries, families moved moved around to have a Catholic, Catholic atmosphere. This is very much like that. Look, what did Chuck Schumer say when he was talking? He was talking to somebody about President Trump and he said he said there were the, there were a hundred ways from here to Saturday or here to Sunday or something to rid yourself of someone. The IRS, he said, has a hundred ways to get to somebody. Well, so do our bishops. Yeah. So do our bishops. They have a hundred ways to get to that. And I, I, I thought you were joking when you're talking about an unconsecrated altar being used. This is one of the reasons. I, you've got to be kidding me. He has half of his priests offering offering mass or, or celebrating mass on a coffee on coffee tables. What what is he talking about? This is this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous when they want to get petty. Nobody can do it better than the clergy. And I, I speak for myself. We, we have this tendency. We get minute down to, down to silliness. Here's the real issue, I think, John Henry and Liz. What state of the church is the Catholic Church in right now? I would say it's in the state of emergency. 
and I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm, I'm being a, a reactionary when I say that. It is in a state of emergency. All of the statistics will show you where we are, and it's not in a good place. Uh, we, have, we have bishops and a hierarchy, generally speaking, and, and specifically speaking, also in Rome, I don't uh, exclude them, who are, who are uh, tyrannical. They're little tyrants. This is incredible. And this is after 50 years of telling Catholics to grow up. Use your own conscience. You're adults now. It's, it's time you start using your own conscience. You you can understand. Blah, blah, blah. This study, uh, I, we won't tell you what mortal sin is. We can't do that anymore. You have to decide for yourself. Well, good. I mean, good, bad. That was that was what was, what was uh, promulgated all these years. Finally, people are being their own persons. Starting their own homes, their own homesteads, this this uh, this uh, retreat center being one of them, because it's outside of the bishop's immediate and full jurisdiction, he can't tolerate it. Being, are you, what are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The only thing that the bishop, I'm not a canon lawyer, but I know a, I know two or three things about canon law. What the bishop could do is say. He gives no permission for the Blessed Sacrament to be reserved in their chapel. He could do that. That's about all. Because he can't prohibit priests from saying a private mass. Uh, and he can't prohibit people from renting rooms. And he can't prohibit people from coming together for a weekend or a week retreat. He can't do that. That's not his to do. I think there's something wrong with with uh, with our hierarchy. There. I don't even know where to begin, but this idea of total control, and they've got to control everything, and God forbid if it smells of two cents, if there's money involved at all, and believe me, they're right there. They're right there. Uh, there's so much wrong with this. Liz, you said it's wrong on so many levels. I, I concur with that. It, it is. It's so wrong on so many levels. But I think in this time of emergency, a lot of things are, are, are off the table. I'll, I'll give you an example, a personal example, but I'll quit with this. Uh, during uh, during uh, uh, the Wuhan plague, all masses were canceled where I was living. All churches were closed. This and the other. I started saying mass in the garage, and people came. Uh, I, I, I married some people, uh, received some people into the church. There was no way. How, how could they be registered in a parish and this, that, and the other? We didn't know what to do. We had no leadership. The churches were closed. Well, that mentality continues. That was the start of something, a radical start of something. But it, it, it exists today. I congratulate those people. And you know what? Let me play the prophet just for a moment, too, before I, before I stop. God is going to bless them. God is going to bless them, and he's going to bless that retreat house. He's going to bless their family. They are going to all of a sudden have more to do there than they can imagine because people are good, and people will respond to this. And people see, you know, especially Americans, Canadians also, <laughs> but respond to injustice. We don't like injustice. And it doesn't matter what your religion is. It's sort of an American thing. We do not tolerate injustices. And this is an injustice. Uh, the bishop should make a good examination of conscience. You know, I also think this is a test case. And they're trying to see how much they can get away with. I, I don't know if we made it clear to people, um, this this property is not owned by the archdiocese. This is privately owned, everything from start to finish. They are a devout Catholic family. Their services are Catholic, but they do not identify, they do not say this is a Catholic facility. This is a, and so this is a test case, you know, that the bishops are trying to um, suppress demoralize this family because it is such it's been such a successful model as we know they're trying to crush it so um for all the others around the country and there are many others that are starting up do not get discouraged this we need to support them on their civil lawsuit um any canonical lawsuit um this is going to be the model it's going to be a beautiful model and it's going to rejuvenate the faith in ways that we cannot imagine. So um, 
be grateful, I'd say, for persecution because it will make all of us stronger. Yeah, and the strength of that family is so beautiful. Having met them, um, the suffering is is great, but the faith of these young people, the, their children, stunning, absolutely stunning. But Father, I'm not going to let you off the hook there. Uh, I've got an even more challenging question for you. Oh, goody. The next thing we're dealing with is also down in San Antonio. When it was going down, uh, for the reason of the Sanctus Ranch story, I happened to call uh, a local other ranch that runs a mission down there, Mission of Divine Mercy. Um, beautiful priests, very small religious community, uh, a holy priest, and, and uh, there's a mother superior. They've been receiving messages, unbeknownst to most people, because they haven't felt called to reveal them. Um, and particularly the past seven years, they've been receiving messages about the absolute crisis in the church. Very, well, it's consoling for me anyway, and, and, and for, I, I think, the church, because the messages speak of the reality that we've been experiencing, of the infiltration in the church. The first message revealed um, on Wednesday of this week was that the church has no shepherd. In addition, they're very hopeful in, in that saying, the reconquest uh, about the infiltration of the church begins now with these messages. So for me, it was super hopeful. But there's a big question because they too are in this kind of uh, disobedience. The, the bishop, I think they presented the, the uh, messages that they received from heaven to the bishop and he told them not to uh, uh, publish them but they felt called by our Lord to publish them. Now, even though it might mean severe sanction from the bishop, um, even unto excommunication or whatever. So what, what do you say to that, Father? What, what is the idea of obedience there? It's a very controversial situation. Look, again, we all have rights. Bishops have rights. I'm not saying they don't. Priests have rights. The laity have rights. There's no question of it. And, for example, the bishop could ask those priests not to say anything, not to mention anything, while the so-called visions or the, 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 uh, the messages. Why, why do I say that? The, it depends on the bishop, and this is why we need bishops, uh, one of the reasons. He has to authenticate and when he authenticates, what he has to say is, there are no theological errors in what is being said. Okay? Not that I don't like the message or I like the... That's not it. He is supposed to judge as a theologian, as an apostle, as the apostle. Is this theologically sound? Now, if while he's doing that, he asks them, and he could do it in a very nice way, doesn't have to be so legal and so cold, right? Please don't say anything about this until we study what's happening. Then I would say he's right to ask for their silence. However, and, and I watched I watched the documentary that you made with him, the, the, the film. Now, I'm dating myself, the film, right? The video. <laughs> I've got I've, I've to get into this century before it ends. The bishop is simply asking them to be quiet, period. Not while I'm doing this investigation or while I'm studying this matter, just period. Well, no, no, that's not what they have to do. And if, for, for example, if they're convinced that the message is from God, well, sooner or later, the absolute truth of that matter will come out. It'll come out. It will be of God or it won't be of God. So it's that simple. If it is of God, how do you keep that to yourself? How do you keep that to yourself? And especially when the messages, the divine messages, do not tell you to be silent, but they're addressing problems right for today that are pertinent to what's happening and should be announced. Look, from what I from what I gathered in the video and from what we're talking about here, everything that those messages contained, and I listened carefully, I've been saying it for a couple of a couple of years, longer than a couple of years. I see it. It's happening. There is no leadership. We understand that. Uh, there is chaos. We understand that. 
So anything, everything that I heard in those messages did not come to me as startling. I found them perfectly, perfectly sane and according to right reason. So if you open your eyes, you can see what's happening, right? So I don't find them shocking. What I do find shocking is that a bishop wouldn't want people to remark about such things. That's what scares me. They don't even want you to admit the obvious. Don't even admit that the obvious exists. Well, how can you? How can you not? How can you not? Because somehow it's showing their failure. Unfortunately, John Henry and Liz, the problem is that their their failure should be spotlighted because they're responsible for what's happening right now. All of them are, and Rome included, very much included. I'm skeptical on such things. When I was younger, I believed everything that came out of everywhere, right? I thought, well, this one said, I remember there was, there was a secret message of Sister Lucy in 1974, the world was going to end, and, and it, when it didn't happen, and then something else didn't happen, I started feeling like those Protestants who sold everything and then waited on a mountaintop for the end of the world to come uh, in the year 1000, that kind of thing. However, however, getting back to reality, there are divine messages. They do exist. Our Lady has spoken to many, many, many people over the centuries, from the beginning of the church until now. Our Lord has spoken, intervened, and they've been taken quite seriously, and they have been to the great to the great benefit of salvation of souls. Therefore, therefore, they should be taken seriously. I what this what this priest said, and he said it in a very simple way, very calmly. I agree. I agree that it would. It, to me, it's not impossible that it be divine revelation, that it be a revelation that is that is of divine origin, uh, because I'm seeing what he's saying. Uh, so, just just to recap, the bishop has a right to say, remain quiet while I study it, but he doesn't say just he doesn't have a right to say remain quiet. Period, and I'm throwing this into the trash. No, he doesn't have that right. And I, 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 I fear that's what the case is here, because I think that that's what that's what pushed that priest to say, no, I better make this public. I have I have an obligation to, because nothing is being done on the other level. Again, you have authority shirking its responsibility. Let's take a look at a couple of clips of uh, of what the message is. In case people haven't seen it, you can go to lifesightnews.com for the full story, of course. But uh, here's a couple clips. Children, the battle looms and you are asleep. I come to awake you as a good mother who being vigilant and keeping watch over her children and seeing the increasing danger shakes her children so that they may not perish without fighting. Children, these are the times announced from of old in which the thrice cursed serpent will poison many and meddle in what is ours and will rise to confuse the nations with his puppets, his servants, to destroy all that is of God and to take his place in sovereignty. His longing to be adored and his hatred for God have motivated him to prepare for centuries what is now being unveiled before your eyes. Now Jesus continues. Follow me in this tremendous hour, as on that Friday in which all the powers of the devil united to torment me and put me to death, they now come together once more to torment and put my church, my mystical body, to death, and thus give death to all that belongs to God. Satan has never ceased longing to be adored, and what you see now is his plan to supplant God in everything. I let him show his plan, uncover his servants and his machinations, so that you can see them, so that you can realize who he is and where he has infiltrated himself. Children, he has infiltrated everything, and he thinks that he will have dominion over all. And I must let him continue to believe this while I gather my army to destroy his works at the appointed hour. This is the hour, children. I call you to my army. I speak to you, and I will speak to you. Do not reject my voice. My voice will thunder and will resound and will destroy every work of Satan. Open your eyes and your ears to these words of mine. Well, Father John Mary said that he 
I think for 20 years has been receiving thousands of these prophetic messages. Not thousands, but yes, he's. they've been receiving many messages over, over many years, yeah. And listening to the messages, it's very interesting because it's much of what we've been talking about here is that we're in a spiritual war. Satan has infiltrated all levels of the church. Um, there is apparently quite a sense of urgency in the messages. Um, and so, therefore, um, I expect that the more we hear these messages, we'll understand why Father is compelled to release them. And Our Lady and Our Lord calling for a luminous army um, to fight for the church um, and that um, Our Lord's going to intervene. Um, you know, th- what What this reminded me of, John Henry and Father, I was like, here we go again, you know, Fatima, the most important message in the 20th century, the you know, bishops haven't followed it. Um, they've kept uh, the third secret quiet. I mean, you know, it's like follow the directions of you know, heaven. And you know, if, in fact, these messages are valid and compelling and truthful, but we need to follow these messages. Um, thus far, everything Father John Mary has said has been something that you know any Catholic who's been paying attention would have to say, right, there's confusion and chaos in the church. Um, Satan has infiltrated the church. Yes, you know, all that all that is true, and that the church is without a shepherd. So there's a, um, this compelling message that he's receiving. Let's play it out. In the meantime, we know as Catholics what we need to do. Um, I, you know, I think what is so frustrating for me is that you know Our Lady continues to you know, appear over the centuries to to poor people, to illiterate people, to children, because the hierarchy and others, you know, sophisticated people like to decide when her messages or our Lord's messages are revealed. Um, and we can pick and choose. Um, so um, I, I thought Father John Mary was a um, very holy, um, authentic, uh, seem, you know, seemingly very honest priest. Um, and um, you, I mean, I know John Henry that you know this group. I mean, Divine Mercy is is a devotion that has been growing certainly from John Paul II. And um, this mission, I mean, I guess don't mess with Texas is the theme of our show today, right? <laughs> I mean, Indeed. that's everything seems to be coming between Strickland, uh, the Sevignes, and Father John Mary. And better pay attention to Texas. Um, so anyway, and just kind of preliminary, those are my my thoughts about this very interesting uh, video that in group of holy people down in Texas. If you go and watch the documentary, you'll you'll see there are a number of canceled priests there we talked to, all holy as all get out, and yet all canceled for being holy, mostly over um, their their wanting to say the Latin Mass and also over homosexuality. Yes. Daring to speak the truth to power about sodomy. Those are the items that get you canceled uh, in uh, in Archbishop Garcia Siller's diocese for whatever reason. If you want to follow the messages, by the way, um, they're going to be released to more messages Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern, right on LifeSiteNews.com. Tune in. You'll be able to see them uh, air live. Also, I have to mention a lot of people wrote in about concerns about, oh, it's unapproved and so on. Well, let me tell you this. Fatima and Lourdes were unapproved during the time of the miracles. If you wanted to be one of the people having part in the miracles, that wouldn't have been you if you were waiting for their approval. So messages from heaven do come. In Amos 3, 7, we learn God doesn't do anything without telling his prophets. That didn't end in the Old Testament. That's today too. The bishop is supposed to be prophet, priest, and king. Yet today the bishops are not fulfilling their roles because if they were, they would all be shouting from the rooftops about what Francis is doing to the church. And they're not. They're silent. The silence of the bishops is probably the greatest scandal in the world today next to the Pope himself. 
And finally, as Father said, it's just saying what we are already seeing, that the infiltrations happened, that, uh, you know, this is mass havoc. But you know what? The message from heaven's needed because while we see that on this show and probably many of you watching see it, the wide world does not see that. In fact, many in the hierarchy don't see it yet either. And if we are going to recognize the severity that the world is in right now, you see this pressure coming. It's not only from the church, this kind of insane pressure and, and pushing us into some kind of Armageddon is coming from the world as well. Canada, where I live, is just pushing legislation that we'll see for online hate, that we'll see those deemed hateful by the liberal government of Trudeau potentially in jail for 20 years, potentially $50,000 fines. Uh, Liz, give us some details on that. And why this is important is because oftentimes what starts in Canada moves south to the United States and elsewhere. Um, the details of the online harms legislation. Now, this is interesting because I want people to pay attention. It appears, and this is how it's being pitched, that it is to protect um, against um, internet child pornography and you know protecting children from all sorts of child sexual abuse on the internet. But in fact, this is really um, involving all types of online harm, such as hate speech defined by the legislation or the government, terrorist content defined by the uh, government or some prosecutor. We've seen how that's played out in the J6 cases. The pro-lifers are the terrorists. Yeah, in segment to violence, right? Look at the Mark Hawk case. Um, uh, sharing of non-consensual intimate images. Then they, they throw in the cyberbullying, inciting self-harm. But that's the cover. That's the lure to get the passage of the legislation. The bottom line is, is exploiting children um, to, um, to criminalize speech. And um, as, uh, what's his point of the- Pierre Polyev, our uh, opposition leader. Yes. He said, what is Trudeau looking in effect to do? Uh, Justin Trudeau means when he says hate speech, he means speech he hates. And I think that's a really good um, meme for all of us to use when we hear that you know term hate speech. Um, so you know, we got to watch this legislation. Those in Canada, um, our life site news folks up in Canada, we got to fight this. It's important because these kinds of legislations have a way of metastasizing in many governments. Um, and if we're not att attentive to the real underlining agenda, they're going to be criminalizing speech. And that is the goal of the globalists to control people by controlling what they say, what they eat, how they live, what kind of medical care they get. That is the ultimate goal of the tyrannical globalists. So this is a very um, sobering legislation, um, and we've got to get it defeated. Can you imagine that this bill is coming under the guise of protecting children from child porn is coming from Trudeau, who backs all of the insane drag queen story hours, the pride parades with absolute nudity and sexual acts on the street in front of little children. Give me a break. They have nothing to do with protecting children from child porn, but it's a great way of trying to pass a piece of legislation, which is probably the most draconian in Canadian history. Father, your take. You hear these things that are coming out and they always start out. Yes, they're protecting the, they're protecting the innocent. They're prote it, it, it's, it's such hypocrisy. What kills me is that they must be talking to somebody this has got to, that approach has got to be making sense to someone in the audience. That's even scarier than what they're trying to do as, as, as dictators, but that they've got an audience ready to buy that and follow through with it. When it's so illogical, it's so, it's so, it's so obviously wrong. Uh, 
I, I don't know. That's scary. He's scary as a dictator, but also that he that he has any percentage um, of the population of Canada that would agree with him is scary. We've got the same thing going on all over the world. He's such a bizarre figure. Pardon me for, for saying this, but uh, I, I'll never get over seeing him hopping around, uh, uh, painting his face like an Indian and, and, and dressing up and jumping around. I, 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 I thought I thought it was somebody on Saturday Night Live making and doing a parody. No, it actually was him. But he's such a bizarre figure that uh, it's it's sort of like an accident. You can't stop watching it, you know. But the, it's scary that he's got a percentage of the population who can be fed with that illogic. That's scary. That's scary. There is an example, though, in the United States this week that shows us that pushback works. All of this stuff about tra- taking Trump off the ballots is not only sticking with Trump. Just like when they debanked Trump and didn't stick with Trump, went to the J6ers, went to Canada, went to the truckers where they're removing your bank accounts. But this idea to remove people from the ballot has spread. They tried it with the Republican governor, uh, AG in Indiana, but the pushback worked. He was taken off or attempted to be taken off. Why? For saying something pro-life. Give us some details, please, Liz. I mean, this is classic. You know, this is lawfare that they're now using legislatively. They saw how it was trying to work with Trump on um, passing legislation. It had, did not pass. But the uh, attorney general in Indiana, and by the way, some of the GOP were also involved in this because he had been very vocal in criticizing abortion. They had pe- legislation that was pending to throw him off the ballot. Again, you know, this is a form of, you know, censorship, um, hate speech uh, control. Um, But the good news is, and this is to, you know, LifeSite News brought this to everybody's attention. Um, Vicki Yamasaki, you know, in her group, been very vocal and pushed back against this legislation. And the um, legislation has been dropped. But That's why, you know, we really have to be not only attentive to our church, but attentive to politics and to um, the legislation that they're trying to slip under the radar um, to um, intimidate speech, um, to intimidate us into, you know, conducting our lives according to the leftist agenda. Um, So it works. Um, Looks like, you know, LifeSite is building its own war room. Thank you, Vicki, you know, for organizing um, an important, this this is important. Let's learn from this lesson and know that you can have an impact and have your voice heard. This is a representative government. This is a government by the people and for the people. And so our voice matters. Let me just pause you there for a second, just to say, if anybody wants to join LifeSite League, which is an activist sort of arm of LifeSite, uh, Vicki Yamasaki has been doing amazing work uh, in there. Please go to LifeSiteLeague.com, LifeSiteLeague.com. Jacinta Rigi heads up that effort for LifeSite News. Uh, please continue, Liz. We are political beings. We have an obligation to be involved in um, the public square, in the moral matters that impact our our lives, our children, our families. And we have to have a sense, you know, just, I was just thinking the truckers out there, well, we better get the truckers from Canada on this new hate speech legislation. It's all of us. Everybody needs to get involved because the left isn't going to stop. The radical left continues to push and push hard. They are fully funded in their radical agenda. Um, you can defeat this legislation in Indiana and turn around and there'll be something else that will be popping up. It's all hands on deck. You know, I think of, you know, um, Father John Mary, who said, you know, that the message from heaven was the luminous army. You know, this is that's a great image for Life Site League and and to continue this fight. Um, in small pieces of legislation and bigger ones. In our school boards, um, at our libraries, it's, as I said, all hands on deck. Now, you mentioned there, Liz, that 
that uh, Catholics have to be involved in the public square we're called to. Um, and part of that responsibility is to vote. And there's obviously a presidential election coming up in the United States uh, in November, and we expect things to get totally hot before then. But we also know um, Trump, who seems to be the only candidate you could possibly vote for among the two presidential um, who, who we're going to end up with, which seems inevitable. Um, there's no question that there are grave problems with President Trump. He's done amazing things. He has, look, I'm sorry, but the overturning of Roe is on him. That has to be acknowledged. Uh, for many people, that's the most significant thing uh, he's ever done. And uh, it's, it's hard to say, you know, that could have happened without him. In addition to that, remember in the beginning, Obama was trying to stomp out the name of God. And they were dropping out of even Christmas uh, greetings and stuff the name of God. And yet Trump came in with a storm uh, talking about Jesus Christ all the time. And um, his wife, Melania, the first lady, opened a meeting with the Lord's Prayer. There was images of Trump and the first lady kneeling um, in front of a grotto. Just, he brought God back to America in a very strong way. He did some incredible things. However, there's a new push for IVF, not only from Trump, from, from a ton of Republicans. So we've got to be involved in the public square. There's a, a great conference happening at Mar-a-Lago, Trump's house in the, in, the, uh, in the resort area there, that's called Catholics Pray for Trump. And it's headed up by uh, Catholics for Catholics, uh, a group that I think we all know. Uh, John Yep is uh, fronting that venture. But we need to support this kind of effort, Prayer for Trump. We know he's the presumptive candidate anyway, and therefore we'll be, or Americans will be voting for him because there's literally no one else. But Trump is not fighting. He's got lots of business prowess. He's got gumption that almost nobody else has in the world. But he's not fighting against flesh and blood. However powerful the World Economic Forum would be and all this, he's fighting against principalities and powers. And if he wants to do that, there's no way of doing that without the grace that comes from being a Catholic in a state of grace with the sacraments. So guess what? We all have to pray for Trump. We have to pray that he accepts the Holy Catholic faith, that he gets imbued with the grace that will flow from that. And there's amazing potential here. So please join us in praying for the conversion of President Trump to the Catholic faith, the faith of his wife, um, and that they're strengthened for this battle we're about to enter. Um, I've asked John Yep to join us just for a second or so to tell us about, uh, about the event that they're holding in Mar-a-Lago on the Feast of St. Joseph, March 19th. John, welcome to the program. John Henry, thanks for having me on to tell your followers about a very special event that we have coming up here in the Catholic world. It is called the Catholic Prayer for Trump event to be held at the president's own house in Mar-a-Lago, Florida, March 19th, the great feast day of St. Joseph. We are gathering Catholic leaders, people like Jim Caviezel, General Michael Flynn, to be there to show him our support and to pray for him as he faces so much attacks and darkness from all around. If you can make it, you need to get your ticket like ASAP by going to CFORC.com. And even if you can't, join us by being part of a, a collective group who will be praying in a novena leading up to the day of. And it will be uh, recorded, so you'll be able to watch the, the recording as soon as it's done. Can't live stream it, sorry. Um, but you don't want to miss it. Please pray for all of us who are involved as we bring the light of Christ to the President and the First Lady and get behind them. Thanks, John Henry. Just like that, we have a new issue um, that's joining the abortion issue. Um, that's IVF. And it was, frankly, tr triggered by um, a wonderful Alabama Supreme Court decision. Um, the state, Alabama state, passed the wrongful death of a minor act. And according to the majority opinion in Alabama, um, they found that frozen embryos are also human beings. And the ruling concerned embryos that were destroyed when someone accidentally dropped some and killed them. 
Um, and the decision in law applies to all unborn children, regardless of their location. Well, that has started, you know, a huge discussion, firestorm, if you will, uh, with Trump, Kerry Lake, and RFK Jr. supporting supporting IVF. This is really an opportunity for the Catholic Church and many pro-lifers to begin the discussion about why the church opposes IVF. It's the deliberate destruction of innocent human life. It also separates sex from procreation and can lead to eugenics. We know that um, many uh, couples and single parents who buy sperm or eggs choose to abort the embryos based on the a possibility of future physical or mental disabilities. We know that many same-sex couples use IVF. Um, and um, we also know that unused embryos, in many respects, I think 97% of um, unused embryos are destroyed, and many are used for scientific experimentation. So IVF now is back on the public um, discussion, um, and I think it's it's an opportunity for the Catholic Church, which I think is going to have to be the laity, to start beginning educating not only Trump, Kerry Lake, and others about why the Catholic Church is opposed to IVF. But this has really, you know, in ways that I was kind of shocked, um, emboldened um, both, you know, the the left women, um, the gay lobby is for IVF. Um, so um, it's we we've got to start educating ourselves about um, why the church is against it. Um, every child, yes, is a blessing, but um, we need to have a discussion about why it is wrong. Um, and um, you know, in the the majority decision in Alabama is you know really quite powerful. Um, in fact, I w- I'd like to quote it. The people of Alabama have declared the public policy of this state is that an unborn human life is sacred. And we believe that each human being from the moment of conception is made in the image and likeness of God, created by him to reflect his likeness. Um, so this will be, I'm convinced, um, an issue that will be debated um, in the in the upcoming election. Um, it affords us an opportunity to, again, talk about this technology, um, which um, is uh, very destructive to um, children. And um, it will, it, this decision is going to have an important effect on IVF, but they're going to battle. We know they, just because the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, that hasn't stopped the left, they've doubled down. They will do so after this Alabama Supreme Court decision. You know what I found fascinating, Liz? It's amazing that Bishop Strickland listens to the Holy Spirit and yeah. is guided by him so much. Unbeknownst to him, the the um, Trump, Kerry Lake, RFK Jr., a bunch of conservatives, a bunch of Republicans in the States were going to start massively promoting IVF. Massively. Right as that's happening, he doesn't know it's going to happen. Our Lord leads him to talk at CPAC about IVF. Watch this. I have to address, as a Catholic pastor, a topic that is of today, of this moment. The Catholic Church proclaimed a document in 1987 under the papacy of Pope St. John Paul II. The second, John Paul the Great, a document, Donum Vitae. I encourage you at this moment, this critical moment, I encourage all of us who know the sanctity of life to read this significant document. And I'll read a few words from it. The possible recognition by positive law and the political authorities of techniques of artificial transmission of life, for example, in vitro fertilization, and experimentation connected with it 
would widen the breach already opened by the legalization of abortion. Brothers and sisters, we must be strong in the sanctity of life and all of its repercussions. I know that today's controversies, many of us are not well versed, but we must be. And we must guide our great politicians, those who we hope will serve this nation into a brighter future. We must guide them in the ethics of the sanctity of life. We can't expect those busy people who are doing their best to fight the battle that we must face. We can't expect them to do it alone. We must help them to be informed that the controversies that are presently in the news right now, this decision by Alabama's court was correct. According to our Catholic faith, we must stand strong and instruct these good men and women that are calling to lead us, and we need them to lead us. We must help them understand the intricacies of what science has done in playing God and having children, embryos, embryonic children frozen and too easily disposed of. When the Alabama court says, no, we cannot dispose of these human beings, let us guide our politicians to know that truth. What you said there, Liz, about Catholics, it's going to be the laity. You need to sharpen up your arguments with regard to IVF, be able to defend the teacher's, church's teaching. It's, a real, it's an opportunity. we got to see this as an opportunity. It's a beautiful opportunity to share the faith, the truth, which exists in natural law, but will now attract people because we seem to be the only ones on earth saying this. And that will resonate. Follow your take. Precisely because we are the only ones on earth saying this, it's true. <laughs> because this is the Catholic position. And the Catholic position on such moral issues as this is the truth. Whether anybody wants to believe that or not, that's, prob that's their problem. It is the truth. I was just thinking, Liz, wouldn't it be refreshing more than refreshing, almost miraculous at this stage, if Rome would come out with such a statement as the Alabama Supreme Court. <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful statement. I mean, could, you couldn't say it better. You could hardly say it better. I mean, it's my favorite. I don't think you could. It's it's right there. It's that. It's that. Just, just something else, too, John Henry, when you were talking be, before about miracles or... or, or uh, uh, visions and, and things not being approved, right? You made a very good point, but I would remind people that at the time of the great miracle of the sun in Fatima, where 70 to 70 to 75,000 people saw this miracle happening, and among them were atheists, Fatima was not approved. Yeah. Hmm. Lourdes, uh, with, with all of the miracles that were happening there and the spring coming forth of water and was not approved. Okay, so that, that's what that's what you're saying, and I think people should understand that. Why we sh we should be cautious on all of these things. I agree. It's not that they're it's not that they, they 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 can't be happening because they're not approved. Nothing was approved until it was, right? Right. And and two, Liz, back, just back to something you said too. If canceling really really became the word of the century, didn't it? Canceling everybody's canceled, but canceling political candidates, you know. Well, when, when I was in fourth grade, we moved to a, a, a new home and a new parish. And the sisters who ran the school were the sisters of St. Casimir. They were Lithuanian and Polish. And I'll tell you one thing. They give an excellent, excellent education. Today, they've gone the way of old sessions. It's, it's the last one out, turn off the lights. But in those days, in those days, they were fantastic. And one thing that they gave, besides a wonderful education, was an understanding and fear of communism. I can remember, I can see it. We were 50, 54 students in the, in the class. And this, these nuns would come in, especially Sister, uh, Sister Rosa Lima. She would have letters from home, letters from Lithuania, from, from relatives trying to get to the United States, trying to get out of the communist satellite. 
just describing the situation there. And one of the things that she, that was described in, in one of her one of her uh, communications with relatives was that there were elections coming up. And and Sister stopped and explained to us. She now when you hear elections in the communist mindset, you are only free to vote or not vote for one candidate. We turned to each other and started laughing. It was so ridiculous. What do you mean vote for one candidate? And there's only one candidate, the communist candidate. You can either vote for him or not vote for him. Period. That's the election. Well, what we laughed out loud that this that's absurd. And all of a sudden, here's what we're doing. We're trying to promote the same thing. Let's eliminate anything so that it only comes down to one candidate. It's amazing. Boy, boy, these are scary times. Scary times. That's really, we're coming to the end of our show. I wanted to not leave without, Liz, you giving that, us that one piece of good news with regard to Cardinal Sarah, if you wouldn't mind setting up that clip. Cardinal Robert Sarah, the former prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Sacraments, um, gave a, a talk um, in Africa saying that he was very proud that the African bishops have completely rejected the controversial uh, Vatican doctrine human fiducia supplicants that proposes priestly blessings of couples in irregular situations and same-sex couples. And um, he, he thought that the reaction and response from the African bishops was very clear. And it also pointed out many of the bishops in Europe, in Kazakhstan, in Poland refused um, because the document as he has said many times, has no scriptural basis and no theological basis. And Cardinal Seurat is one of the most highly respected cardinals um, in, in the church. Um, he is a stalwart defender of Catholic orthodoxy in both teaching and sacramental discipline. And at the symposium, he, there were over uh, 700 participants um, it, from all over East Africa. And um, to me, this is um, an important point. I think we need to highlight, um, and he, he considers this a radical heresy that undermines the church, the body of Christ, and is contrary to the Catholic faith and tradition. Um, so again, a um, powerful voice that oftentimes doesn't speak out, but when he does speak out, he speaks out with clarity and with fidelity. Um, so thank you for Cardinal Seurat. Um, Catholics around the world appreciate um, your beautiful witness to the Catholic faith. Thank you, Father Murr. Thank you, Liz, for being with us today. Thank you, John Henry. Great to see you thank both. Thank you, John Henry. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Father. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time on Faith and Reason. Hi, everyone. This is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.